Welcome to the Get Over Yourself podcast. This is Brad Kearns. We always want to have something keeping us sharp, especially if you're an old time competitive athlete. Deep down, that never goes away. Hey, listeners, welcome to a breather show, or maybe I'll call this a breathing hard show because I want to talk about this incredible experience I had last week where I went out there and broke the official Guinness World Record for the fastest hole of golf ever played. And the guidelines are that it has to be a 500-yard, a very long par-5 hole on the golf course. So you've probably heard me talk about my favorite sport of speed golf, where they have tournaments where you play the entire course, you keep score, and you add together your strokes and your minutes on the course where you're running as fast as you can and trying to get through the course and shoot a good score. So you add your strokes and your minutes together, and that's what a speed golf tournament is all about. But this little folly is sort of a one-off, an offshoot of the sport of speed golf where uh, the Guinness Book of Records has an official category of the fastest hole of golf, and you can look on YouTube, uh, the previous record holder, this gentleman named Steve Jeffs of the United Kingdom, has this amazing viral video with 165,000 views of this guy playing a par five in record time of a minute 50 seconds. When I saw this video uh, back in 2017, late 2017, I was captivated. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And it blends together my two favorite things to do, which is sprinting. I'm not so much for that long distance endurance stuff anymore. So running the whole golf course about five miles is kind of my outer limit. But I love to sprint and do those explosive workouts And then, of course, playing golf. So if you look on YouTube, you'll see my performance. You'll see Steve Jeff's previous record. And what we're talking about here is playing the hole as quickly as possible. They're not counting your strokes, but of course, the fewer strokes you take, the less time you're going to spend. And I started training for this with great devotion at the start of 2018. And I'd go out to the course and pick this ninth hole on the course that I usually play in Sacramento and speed it up and try to get some sprints in and just practice that sensation of hitting a ball while your heart is beating in your throat and you're completely out of breath and you just have to get that swing done anyway, because even if you settle down for five seconds or seven seconds or 10 seconds, that's way too long to waste on a single hole world record attempt. And you're also still not going to catch your breath. So I had to train my body to run a full speed sprint and then stop and then swing at a golf club and then do it again. And it was a lot of fun to practice for. It was a specific goal that I had. And oh my gosh, at my age, you know, I'm long since retired from the professional circuit when competition was my life and my consuming passion. And now I have all kinds of different responsibilities and uh, passions and endeavors in life, being a parent, uh, running a business, all that kind of fun stuff. And to have something to keep me going and keep me focused, I believe is really, really important. Uh, There's a great post on Mark's Daily Apple, maybe a couple years old now, called Living Life with an Edge. And Mark and I subscribe to that same ethos where you don't want to just settle into each passing decade uh, telling stories about how your exploits were back in your teens and 20s. We always want to have something keeping us sharp, especially if you're an old-time competitive athlete. Deep down, that never goes away. And so you got to find some way to recalibrate. Of course, you're not going to be playing playing pickup basketball for three hours a day like you were at your heyday, but have something that's age appropriate, that promotes health and longevity rather than compromises it. Like in my example of being a professional triathlete, that was a great passion and a great journey that I had from ages 20 to 30, but it came at a pretty significant compromise to my overall health, certainly did not promote longevity or balanced lifestyle or any of those things. So to move on from that, I remember transitioning into coaching Hughes Sports with my son and daughter. And so really my competitive goal for a while was to dominate young kids in soccer, basketball, and track. And that was really fun because at first I had no problem being the best player on the fourth grade team, but I had to keep my A game going and keep in shape and keep training and be a participant 
participatory coach in the practices so that I could keep up these guys when they got into sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And seventh and eighth grade, oh my gosh, my son was on this really highly competitive AAU basketball team. And I still contend that I would be possibly in the starting five. And I could put up some good points when we had these full bore scrimmages. And then when it was time to run lines after practice, I would come in second or third on the team. I'd push myself to maximum effort as a, what, 40, 45-year-old guy. But then the great transition in life took place and these guys started going from eighth grade into high school and becoming grown men. And I went from being a possible candidate for MVP to completely blown off the court and with my tail between my legs going home. My son actually had to tell me one night when we were driving home from the open gym where we'd play pickup and form teams. He said, "Uh, Dad, you don't have to drive me anymore. I can get a ride from someone else. And I'm like, oh, no, I love driving and I really love participating with you guys. And he's like, "Uh, you don't have to play anymore either because it was becoming apparent that I could no longer guard anybody on the high school team. They were just too quick and strong for me. So my day came and went. But it was a really beautiful and graceful transition away from uh, being mixing up with the kids and then going into the stands as any proper high school parent should. You should leave it to the professional coaches, the guys who do this for a living and just cheer in the stands and don't interfere. But then I had to go look for something else and the sport of speed golf came along and I was so excited to train for these tournaments and go out there and compete with the best guys in the world. Uh, I came in 20th, 20th, and 19th, three years in a row in the Speed Golf World Championships in the professional division. And I was proud to say I was one of the oldest guys out there. There was a couple other guys. Jamie Young, notably Wisconsin, became world champion past the age of 50. So he was carrying the torch for the old guys. And I was doing the best I could out there to keep a steady pace and shoot a good score. So always having something in the background. It doesn't mean I was training four hours a day and neglecting my life balance and other core daily responsibilities that were now more important than when I was a professional triathlete and living and breathing by how well I did at the race. But I always have something kicking in the background. You know my passion for high jump. If you look at the podcast logo or go search on YouTube for my five foot five inch high jump, five foot four inch high jump beyond the age of 50, which is a pretty respectable performance for an old guy. So always having some fun. And what's really great as you mature and gain in your years and gain a fresh perspective about the place that sports and competition should have in your life, I feel like I've become much more balanced and easygoing, definitely gotten over myself if you compare to my career as a triathlete where I was wrapped up in the business aspects of it and winding those around my over misplaced competitive intensity where I'd get down and discouraged if I had a bad race and then kind of a little bit overinflated if I had a string of good races, crazy times. But now, of course, this stuff is all just for fun. Yes, I like to make a big deal of it and put it on YouTube in hopes that I'll motivate and inspire others. But I'm really doing this for life enrichment and personal growth. And I don't care if anybody's there or not. Oh my gosh, when I cleared those high jump bars, when I just had those wonderful outings uh, by myself in an empty high school stadium, and when I cleared those bars, I had a couple notable clearances, five, six, that was now five years ago, and then five, uh, five, uh, two years ago. Oh my gosh, I screamed like I had just won the National Championships Triathlon on on TV, on ESPN, with thousands of people cheering at the race venue. I had the same sense of satisfaction and just personal well-being from working hard and achieving a goal as I did when I was a an actual professional prominent athlete. So it's all about recalibrating and keeping healthy, balanced goals that fit nicely into your lifestyle. And this tee-up is to finish the story about going for this Guinness World Record. So it turns out it's a little bit complicated, and you have to apply to the Guinness people in the United Kingdom and fill out this detailed application and the approval process takes 12 weeks. And I remember one day getting an email in late April of 2018 saying, congratulations, you have been approved for a world record attempt. So I very quickly set up for the record attempt, which is a big deal because you have to get around 10 people present to hit all their guidelines and check boxes. You need two people that you have nothing to do with prior, some absolutely independent witnesses to sign these sworn statements that they actually saw the record take place. You need 
two official timekeepers, and they have to prepare a sworn statement that they timed it accurately and how they timed it. You need a photographer for still photos of every shot that you take, and you need a videographer to record the entire event from start to finish unbroken. I need permission from the golf course, the greenskeeper, the pro, the guy in the pro shop. And so this whole thing was orchestrated. And just the process of doing that, I started to feel a lot of pressure, man. I was like, okay, uh, so I'm arranging this whole thing. I'm turning away the other golfers from that hole because we have six carts out there and we're making a big deal. And all of a sudden, it's a little different than me just getting to the ninth hole on my practice rounds right before dark and sprinting and having some fun and timing myself with a watch. So that was also kind of cool to feel that pressure and those butterflies coming on the day of the attempt. And my first attempt was in Sacramento on May 8th of 2018. And I, I tell you, the biggest pressure I felt was my girlfriend's uh, sister and a husband agreeing to drive down three hours from Redding, California to help support my event. And Sean, the former CHP executive, was going to be the official timer because he had all experienced timing in his business, was going to do the sworn statement. And I was like, man, if these guys are driving three hours, I better come through and pull this thing off. And the thing about the attempt is that because you're sprinting at full speed in order to break this very, very legit record that Steve Jeffs put up of one minute and 50 seconds for 500 yards, you pretty much have to open up the throttle all the way. You can't hold anything back. So the maximum number of attempts really is two or three, knowing that you're going to be slower on your second and third attempt. So it's really rolling the dice and going for it all in on that very first attempt when you can actually sprint at full speed without that fatigue factor creeping in, and then hope that you're going to hit good shots. And oh my gosh, it was a great experience. I came through under pressure on that very first attempt. I ran really fast. Uh, I kept the ball in front of me and in front of the hole as well, which is a key component of this high-speed effort. And I took six strokes for a bogey and finished in one minute and 40 seconds. So I broke the existing world record by 10 seconds, had a great celebration, lots of fun, uh, submitted all my forms and documents. I had to send them about 20 different documents, uploading the pictures and the sworn statements and then awaiting the official ratification process, which takes another 15 weeks or some crazy time frame like that. Uh, so then you might guess what happened to an exuberant competitive guy who had such a great time doing this. That's right, you guessed it. The brain starts thinking, the competitive juices are flowing, sitting here analyzing the videos and realizing that I hit a couple shots that were less than perfect, and maybe, just maybe, let's think, Maybe I could break the existing record if I put together a flawless performance. So, yep, I started making plans for another attempt just for fun, going down to Los Angeles and doing it in front of family and friends down here just to kind of change a pace, uh, getting all set up at another course for another record attempt. And I'd already done a ton of R&D analyzing Steve Jeff's video. I give him so much credit for inspiring me, but I noticed he was carrying a small bag of several clubs and having to replace the clubs and pick pick up the bag and put it down. I'm like, you know what? For one hole, I think the winning ticket here is going to be to try to play the hole with a single club, a three wood. So if I take two big three wood shots that are, that are good, I'm going to be up near the green. And then I have to do a very clever and complex little chop shot where you just hit a very short three wood shot running along the grass on the ground and then rolling onto the green. And then finally learning how to sink a putt with a three wood, which is pretty difficult, but it can be done. Uh, Mark Sisson was one of the guys that recommended I just take a single club. And of course, my golf guru, the great speed golf legend, Christopher Smith up in Oregon. So I'm doing a lot of problem solving and consulting and realizing that I'm going to go out there and learn how to play a hole with a single club. So in the Sacramento attempt, I feel like that was my secret weapon, was learning how to play the hole with one club. And then also, and again, analyzing the video, realizing that you're not really going to catch your breath, even if you rest for five seconds. That's what we do in an eight. 18 hole speed golf tournament because we have to pace ourselves and we want to hit really good shots. But I realized that if I could train my brain and my body to run up to a ball while running full speed and heaving as hard as you'll ever breathe, and then just 
just take the swing. It doesn't matter. Even if I can't breathe and I'm barely holding steady, I got to learn how to hit the ball immediately. So I was lowering my time over the ball between one and two seconds. I'd just get there and swing. I wouldn't even look at the target. I'd look at the target running up to the ball and then get there and whack it. So being able to practice that over and over, I thought if I could put everything together, maybe I'd take another shot at it. And even if I don't break the record, I'd have a lot of fun and have another group of people watching me. So I set up the whole crew of another 10 people and got out there. And then what proceeded to happen was it was really a miracle performance and it was a testament to these concepts that are often discussed and studied in the realm of peak performance athletics where you enter the zone or the flow-like state where you're on another plane. You're not thinking everything's automatic and you're performing these great feats. I like to talk about Reggie Jackson in the World Series when he hit three home runs with three swings of the bat. He got up to bat and hit the first pitch out of the park three times in the biggest baseball game in the world. And it's one of the greatest athletic performances where this guy was operating on a different plane than we normally think that you know, humans are capable of. Same with Tiger Woods when he went out there in the 2000 US Open and won the tournament by 15 strokes in an absolute zone for four days, hitting shots that the other golfers, the greatest in the world, could not come close to to equaling. That's one of the greatest performances of all time. And we have these Olympic performances like Wade Van Niekerk in the Rio Olympics when he ran the 400 meters from lane eight completely blind in what many people say is the worst lane or the second worst lane. And he just started sprinting from the gun because he couldn't see anybody. And he kept sprinting all the way to the finish line to shatter the world record at 400 meters. We have so many examples of these athletes transcending the normal boundaries of time and space and getting into that flow state. And I felt like that happened to me on this hole because what happened out there was again, sprinting at full speed. I hit four perfect shots on this par five and sank a short putt again with my three wood, knocking that birdie into the hole. And it was an absolute miracle. And I'm so happy to talk about it because I feel like You know, I played golf my whole life. I was a very competitive and driven kid, but I didn't have the right temperament for golf. I was kind of a tightly wound guy that was better suited for running where I could just get that competitive outlet and release that aggression onto the race course. And if you're struggling or doing poorly in a cross-country race or a track meet, you just step on the gas pedal and start hurting more, and that takes care of everything. But of course, golf is totally different than these uh, endurance sports where they're straight ahead, go, go, go. You have to keep a calm head at all times. You have to manage and regulate your emotions. You can't ever get down on yourself or experience negative thoughts or get tense and nervous because that'll just ruin you and and get you out of that flow-like state to where you start hitting worse shots and then they build upon themselves to where you just crater your entire round. And I was pretty capable of choking. I remember going into the junior tournaments and just playing terrible and being so distraught halfway through the round, I wanted to quit or playing against some great players that I used to play with when I was a young guy and, you know, would get down to the final couple holes where, you know, there was $5 on the line, which was a fortune back then. And I'd find a way to screw it up if I had a lead. I just didn't have that great temperament that my father had for golf and consequently got steered into the endurance sports in high school and kept at that for the next 15 years. And kind of put golf on the back burner, even though it was my, my family sport and I have a tremendous passion for it. So finally, with maturity in the years, I'm able to enjoy myself out there, especially in the speed golf tournaments. It's such a thrill to just go through the course and play quickly. Even if you hit a bad shot, guess what? You better run to the next ball and hit that thing. You can't waste any time complaining or worrying about it. So I feel like my temperaments b- become better over the years and I'm ideally suited for speed golf because I just get in that flow-like state and don't get in into that overly analytical mindset that so many golfers suffer from. So the way this hole went was big three wood right down the middle, another one right down the middle coming up close to the green, almost 500 yards and two shots. And then I had this little chip shot that just bounced and hit over the bumpy ground and then just released onto the smooth putting surface and rolled right up there next to the hole. And I couldn't see the green because it's higher than the, the fairway as you run up the last hill to the green. But I heard the my group, my peoples going, ooh, 
ah, oh, oh my gosh, get in. You know, it almost went in and I just had to drop this little putt in and I just screamed with joy because it was like putting together the ultimate clutch performance and something that I'd really never been able to do at that level. It just felt really special. So I wanted to share it with you and bring out those insights about maintaining that competitive edge, finding something that you have a passion for, that you want to set that goal and better yourself and measure yourself against yourself. Of course, I wanted to break the world record, but the thrill of just executing perfect shots on that day, it didn't even matter if I was timed. It was just like this amazing thrill that I could put it all together and have a great time and also share it with all my friends and family out there that was just making it a special night. And of course, uh, over with really quickly, because after that first attempt, I said, okay, we're done. We're going home. No three attempts like I took in Sacramento because I wanted to see if I could better it after that first attempt. Anyway, that's my message about my speed golf world record. I appreciate you (laughs) bearing with me, listening to me. Hopefully it gets you excited about finding something that'll keep that edge with you and keep that passion burning to where your workout regimen is calibrated towards some distinct goal in the future. So you have something to work toward and keep you honest and focused. I had the podcast with Vinny Tortorich recently, and he says, straight up, I climb Mount Whitney once a year. And that's kind of my checkpoint to make sure that I'm still in shape, still fit, delaying the aging process as much as possible. Mount Whitney is the highest peak in the continental United States at 14,500 feet. The climb starts at 8,500 feet. So it's a pretty huge day. Uh, It takes, you know, 14 hours, according to Vinny. And boy, you better be in shape for that. You better have some preparatory hikes going. But to do that once a year, it seems like a wonderful benchmark to just know that that's coming around every summer. You got something to do. You got to put your work in. You can't, you know, let yourself go in the winter because you're trying to keep it sharp and fresh for some peak performance goal. I'm not sure I'm going to attempt that record again anytime soon because I don't think I can top it. I can't wait to sit back and watch other people go for it. But again, I'll go out there and have fun myself some night, maybe just time myself with my wristwatch. Doesn't matter if I come near that other performance because honestly, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. The magic of that evening was I don't think if I tried that again 50 times, I don't think I could match that performance of making a birdie running at full speed. In fact, I don't make too many birdies when I'm playing with 14 clubs and a golf cart and a good caddy telling me which way the wind's blowing and which way the putt breaks. So fun stuff. I hope you can find some fun stuff to do yourself, especially broadening your horizons about fitness when we're stuck in the gym and going through these routines of doing two spin classes a week and one session with your personal trainer. It can very easily get to be Uh, a little bit boring and a little bit difficult to motivate for. So if you're feeling yourself in one of those ruts where you kind of don't know what the purpose of your workout is, try something crazy. Sign up for one of these popular uh, Spartan races or mud runs where you're going through obstacles and people are broadening the horizons of fitness really nicely now with these unique new events. So it's not just running a 10K or doing a triathlon. There's all kinds of great stuff to do out there. Set a goal, go for it, have some fun. And then send a note to the show. Let's hear about it. Get over yourself podcast at gmail.com. I'd love to read some success stories and some inspiring messages from you. Thank you so much for listening. Talk to you soon. Hi, it's Brad to talk about ancestral supplements. Question for you, how's it going with the critically important health objective of consuming some of the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet, namely bone marrow, collagen, and nose-to-tail organ meats like liver, heart, kidney, and more? Yeah, how's it going? Pretty poorly? How did I guess? I have to admit the same. I'm sorry, folks. I've known for a long time since Dr. Kate Shanahan and her wonderful book, Deep Nutrition, emphasized that this is a sorely missing element of the modern diet, but a huge part of the ancestral diet that made humans the healthy creatures that they are today. And now we have a fantastic and convenient solution from Ancestral Supplements because they make New Zealand-sourced bone, marrow, and nose-to-tail organ meats, liver, heart, kidney, pancreas, spleen, and more, delivered in simple, convenient gelatin capsules. 
oh my gosh, I love this product and I love what this company's all about. Go on their website, ancestralsupplements.com, read one of the most impactful and inspiring mission statements you'll ever see from a company. Listen to how they describe their product. Traditional peoples, Native Americans, and early ancestral healers believe that eating the organs from a healthy animal would strengthen and support the health of the corresponding organ in the individual. The traditional way of treating a person with a weak heart was to feed the person the heart of a healthy animal. Sound hokey to you? I'm sorry, but this is extremely well supported with scientific evidence confirming that these are the foods that our DNA evolved with and are sorely missing from the modern food supply. That's why Ancestral Supplement says that they're putting back in what the modern world has left out to return people back to strength, health, and happiness. And hey, if you're a clean living person that kind of doesn't like the idea of popping a bunch of synthetic vitamins in the name of health, going over to GNC and buying 12 bottles, this is an entirely different story. This is real food packaged conveniently so that you don't have to worry about your liver making skills or how to best cook a kidney. (laughs) Just swallow the pills, man. I throw them in my smoothie every morning. So I'm taking about four or five capsules of the various ancestral supplement products. I'm throwing down the beef organs, the beef liver, the bone marrow. There's so many other ones on their absolutely fabulous and educational website. Thanks for trying it. Ancestralsupplements.com. You will love it. 